Um, any questions I can answer about these points before we get back to our friends, the Jeffersonian Republicans and the Federalists in 1800? Ready to get to Marshall and Jefferson? Marshall and Jefferson, who absolutely, absolutely, despite being, sort of, I think, third cousins, hated one another with a passion. Okay, on we go. An introduction. Now, Marbury versus Madison, really important as a, as a constitutional principle, but I think what makes it all the more fun and really interesting is everything that's going on behind it in terms of the history and politics of the situation. Um, so, Marbury versus Madison is known for its defense of this power of judicial review, right? Which is the authority to declare acts of Congress unconstitutional. That is the thing for which Marbury versus Madison is known. We shouldn't lose sight, though, of the fact that it also, by way of getting there, in that part that it talks about in the beginning, about there being a vested legal right and Madison not get, delivering the commission, is also effectively establishing the court's power to declare acts of the executive branch unconstitutional as well. So judicial review, not just with respect to acts of Congress, but also with respect to the executive branch, including high-level officials, like the Secretary of State. Now, the precise question that was presented in Marbury was rather narrow, and you could say pedestrian. Was William Marbury, this guy William Marbury, not really a famous person to history, entitled to receive his commission to serve as a magistrate, also known as a justice of the peace, for the District of Columbia? Now, I mean, some of you may have sort of realized this, but the whole reason we're getting justices of the peace for the District of Columbia is because the capital had just moved, right, down from Philadelphia. They were really establishing D.C. from scratch. It was a swamp down at the Potomac. It was a weird location for the capital that was just agreed on as part of a compromise between the northern and, and southern legislators. And so they had to have some sort of courts to operate this new city that they're building on a swamp. And so they created these offices for justices of the peace. Was William Marbury entitled to his commission to become one of these first justices of the peace for the District of Columbia? And if he was, could the court order the delivery of that commission? Okay. Now, the backstory here. Go back to the election of 1800. We had George Washington as president for the first two terms, right? From when Congress first assembles in 1789 until uh, 1796. He famously decides, Washington says, two terms is it. He, steps, he says, I'm not running for a third term. John Adams wins the presidency on behalf of the Federalists. These are, again, as I mentioned at the end of class, group of individuals who, it wasn't quite a political party yet, but they were a group of individuals who fought, <laughs> believed in stronger national power. So foremost among these are Adams, Hamilton, who was Secretary of Treasury in uh, Washington's administration, and John Marshall. Now, the folks who were fighting the Federalists were the Jeffersonian Republicans. These are actually, despite being called the Republicans at the time, they are the precursors to and would eventually evolve into what is now the Democratic Party. And they, the biggest individuals, most important individuals, are Jefferson and Madison, also this sort of ne'er-do-well named Aaron Burr, 
who ends up, of course, murdering, I don't know, is it a murder when it's a duel? He and Hamilton go out and have the duel over in Hoboken, and he ends up killing Alexander Hamilton in the duel when I think the bullet, like, ricocheted off a branch. He tried to shoot it above him, and craziness. Um, okay. The Jeffersonian Republicans, Adams is president, right, from 18, or 1796 until 1800. There is a bitter, bitter presidential election, or general election, in 1800. The Republicans win, and they win handily. Right? And they take over, they win the House of Representatives, a majority in the House, a majority in the Senate, and Either Jefferson or Aaron Burr wins the presidency. Now, we, ha we didn't have the 12th Amendment to the Constitution yet. And the way the voting went in the Electoral College is individuals submitted two votes, the electors submitted two votes, and whoever got the most votes would be president, whoever got the second most votes would be vice president. Nowadays, we think that's kind of weird. It would have like worked out with... Obama as president and Romney as vice president or something like that. So the, this was evolving. Um, and Jefferson, because the Jeffersonian Republicans had the exact same number of, all of them submitted two ballots. All of them submitted one for Jefferson and one for Burr. They end up tied. Because there was no separate balloting for vice presidents. Now, what happens when we have a tie in the Electoral College? Or, or more accurately, no one wins a majority in the Electoral College under the Constitution. What's that? Anyone know who, gets, who decides then? It almost happened in 2000. Yeah. It goes to the House of Representatives to resolve... And what's weird about the when it goes to the House is they vote state by state. They each have one individual vote as state delegations. So it's, it's all in there in the text. It's a very strange system. Thankfully, it hasn't happened too often. It did happen in 1800, though, and it's not actually resolved until mid-February. No one actually really wanted, other than Aaron Burr himself, wanted Aaron Burr to be president. But it was hard to resolve this because there was a dead heat and there was all sorts of political horse trading. This goes on until mid-February of 1801 when it's finally resolved that Jefferson is going to become, after 36 ballots in the House, that Jefferson is going to be the next president. Okay. The Federalists are being swept out of office, but Adams' term doesn't actually end until March 3rd, midnight of March 3rd of 1801, and the way it worked back then, I think because of the distance of travel, the new Congress wasn't actually going to come sit until December of 1801. So that meant the Federalists, although they've been voted out of office, still had majorities in both the House and the Senate, and they still had a Federalist president in the form of Adams. What did they do? Well, they went about figuring out how they could retain power even though they were being swept out of power. One, January 20th, 1801. Now, we're, we're within two months of when, you know, we're about five weeks from when Adams is going to be swept out of office. He nominates John Marshall to be Chief Justice of the United States. And he is confirmed by February 4th, which is exactly one month before Adams is going to leave office. February 13th, Congress enacts the Circuit Courts Act. They create six new federal courts of appeals and 16 new court of appeals judgeships. And lo and behold, they nominate, Adams nominates and appoints 16 Federalists to these positions who are confirmed on March 2nd and 3rd, the last two days in office for President Adams. I mean, they're just stuffing, stuffing the federal judiciary in the very last waning hours of the Adams administration before the Jeffersonians take hold. 
On February 27th, one week, actually less than a week before Adams is to leave, Congress passes the Organic Act for the District of Columbia. That creates 42 magistrate positions in D.C. And it also reduces, by the way, it reduces the size of the Supreme Court from five to six, or I'm from, from six to five, contingent on the next retirement. So right now, the Supreme Court is entirely made up of Federalists. One of them is not feeling very well and is likely to retire soon, if not die in office. The Federalists on their way out the door say, well, when he retires, there shall only be five justices on the Supreme Court, thereby depriving the Jefferson administration of being able to appoint a replacement. Okay. Now, March 4th, Jefferson is sworn in as president, and all of this comes to a halt. One little hiccup in this whole plan, though. These 42 magistrates, imagine again the state of technology in 1801. They're literally these big pieces of paper that the President of the United States has to sign. They have to go to the Secretary of State's office. Secretary of State has to sign them and seal them. And then these commissions have to be physically delivered to these nominees before they can assume their positions as justices of the peace. Well, they get 38 of them done and delivered. But four of the commissions, as of midnight on March the 3rd, haven't been delivered. One of which belongs to Mr. Marbury. When Jefferson takes office the very next day, he takes the oath of office sworn in by John Marshall himself, Jefferson says, those four commissions shall not be delivered. Marbury then says, wait a second, I've been confirmed, I've, I've, it's been signed, it's been sealed, isn't it? Aren't I a justice of the peace? Jefferson says, no way. And he eventually files suit in December at the Supreme Court, directly in the Supreme Court of the United States. Now, after, so that's December 1801, Marbury files suit, saying, look, I need my commission in order to serve as justice of the peace. Republicans now, though, are in control of the government in its entirety, and they go about undoing what the Federalists had done on their way out the door. They enact the Repeal Act, in which they abolish all of these courts of appeals and the 16 judgeships that the Adams, that the Federalists had created. Now, that creates a pretty big constitutional question because federal judges are supposed to have life tenure, right? And they completely eliminate all of these judgeships. And, and their argument was, well, we're not, we're not firing the judges, we're just eliminating their offices, big constitutional question, whether that would be okay. They're a little worried about what the Supreme Court might do in answering that question, in large part because we have John Marshall now as the Chief Justice. So what do they do? They abolish the Supreme Court's term and say, you guys can't meet for another year or so. Um, three, they start impeachment proceedings against some a lower court Federalist judge, a guy named John Pickering, Turns out he was uh, suffering from dementia and alcoholic, so he was, there were other reasons for impeaching him other than the fact that he happened to be a Federalist. But the Republicans were making it perfectly clear he's just the first. There will be others. There will be Supreme Court justices who we will go after if they don't start making decisions that are more consistent with what we think the Constitution needs. Okay, so that is the setting in which Marbury happens. Again, Marbury files suit in 1801, but then the Jeffersonians have canceled the Supreme Court's term. So they can't, the court actually can't decide the case for 14, 15 months until February of 1803 because they are legally forbidden from meeting during the interim. I want to repeat, these are some details that I mentioned at the very end of class. I want to repeat. Again, Marbury filed his suit directly 
in the Supreme Court as an original action, not an appeal. That's important, right, to the legal analysis. Two, the relief that Marbury sought was a writ of mandamus, which is simply an order to an executive official to perform a ministerial, that is a non-discretionary act. Deliver the piece of paper, which was a purely ministerial act. Neither, and again, lastly, for purposes of Article 3 of the Constitution, neither Marbury nor Madison were quote-unquote public ministers or consuls. Again, important for understanding what's going on in the legal analysis. Okay, that's all just setting up what's going on. Last question from Marbury. Does the Supreme Court have the authority to declare an act of Congress unconstitutional? Uh, yes, right? We wouldn't have this course, we wouldn't have this big, thick book if it didn't, right? So we know the answer is yes. I love the way Marshall... I miss some of this language. You know, occasionally in the, like, Decemberist songs, you hear things like this today, but generally speaking, people don't talk like this anymore. It is a question deeply interesting to the United States, but happily not of an intricacy proportion to its interest. Sort of, I, I don't know, I, there, there's an earnest sort of overwrought understatement to that that, that is fun. Um, now, notice how Marshall frames the question here. In the way in which he sequenced the questions, he's already determined that the statute is unconstitutional, right? We've already gone through that analysis with Lilly, with Ozzedek. It's unconstitutional. And then he asks, having concluded that in fact it is unconstitutional, he bends back and says, well, can an act... <laughs> bless you, that is nonetheless unconstitutional, repugnant to the Constitution, nonetheless become the law of the land. Can a law that is not actually law nonetheless operate as law? Now, is that the relevant question? Really? Really. Not in Marshall's head, but for us. Is that the relevant question? Or maybe I should just ask, since I'm strongly leading this. What is the relevant question? Since I don't think Marshall's really is. What is the relevant... What, what are we actually asking here? What's at stake on this last question with respect to the power of judicial review? Does anyone really think that unconstitutional laws are nonetheless constitutional and therefore enforceable? So if that's not, the ca if that's not really the question, what is the real question? Yeah. Yeah. Who gets to decide? Right. Marshall's kind of already assumed the answer to the question by deciding in the, the preceding section that this law is unconstitutional. What other? Who else might decide that? Maybe the executive branch, because the president has to sign laws into law, right? Unless there's going to be a veto override, every law has been signed by the President of the United States. Maybe the constitutional judgment occurs at that point, where the President says, I need to be sure that this is constitutional. If it has the President's signature, then we have a judgment, right? That it is, in fact, constitutional, that the other branches must observe. Who else? Congress, right? Congress passed the law. They implicitly decided that Section 13 of the Judiciary Act was constitutional. Why shouldn't the court simply defer to them? That's the question, is whether the court should have the power to second-guess and overrule the judgments of Congress and the President, because clearly here... They have already decided that they thought the law was constitutional. They wouldn't have passed it or signed it into the law if they didn't. That's the relevant question, right? So, that leads us then to the question of 
What are the justifications? This is the big portrait of Marshall that sits um, in, in the East and West conference rooms at the Supreme Court. Absolutely gorgeous rooms. They have portraits of every Chief Justice of the United States. And there's a really, this is a nice one that sits over the, I think it sits right over the um, fireplace in the East Conference Room of John Marshall. Um, what are his justifications? The most famous case, maybe in American law, establishing the most foundational principle of constitutional law, that the Supreme Court can sit in judgment and declare acts of Congress unconstitutional. Why? Why? Yeah. He says it's um, the prominence and duty of the judicial department to see the lies. One of the more famous sentences in all of American law. The province and duty of the judicial department to say what the law is. And could you just add some more detail to that? Why does that matter? Uh, well, he also goes on to say if two laws are conflict with each other, then the courts must decide the operation of each. Okay. And now this section 13 of the Judiciary Act is one law. What else is law? Okay, now that's a really important point, too, because that was actually somewhat disputed. A lot of people thought of constitutions as being something other than law. They were sort of overarching charters rather than law in the same sense as a statute might be law. Marshall says no. No, especially written constitution. Right? Because we're coming from Britain. Britain hasn't had, or until recently, has never had a written constitution. The constitution was just unstated principles dating back to Magna Carta and things like that. Right? He says, look, one of the very important things about our new situation in the United States is we have a written constitution. A written constitution is law. Now, if we put these different pieces together, written constitution is law. It is the obligation and duty of courts to say what the law is. If a court is presented with two different laws, one of which is supreme to the other, Right, because the Constitution is supreme to statutory law, then courts are obligated, obligated to address whether the statute is consistent with the higher law of the Constitution. That's exactly what courts do. It would be immoral, absurd for us not to. Okay. That is, I mean, that is really the crux of what he's saying. That he adds some details onto this. Anyone want to add on to this part of the of the equation? Yeah. Is it that beforehand is that he thinks that the very state of the Constitution is like the supreme law of the land, and the Constitution directly amends the power of Congress and other parts of the government, so he doesn't let that be silly for Congress to pass the Right. Now, it's hard to... The, the problem with that is it seems to be answering the question that Marshall phrases of whether an unconstitutional law shall nonetheless be treated as a law, which really isn't the question, right? But you're absolutely right. I think implicit in what he's saying is if you invest Congress with this judgment to decide whether their own laws are constitutional or not, in effect you're going to be treating statutes no differently than the Constitution itself, right? Because they can just decide that one of the important things that the Constitution does is limit what Congress and the government can do. If Congress can simply pass statutes that in its judgment, well, whether regardless of what its judgment does, 
that, that override the Constitution, then in effect, the Constitution does nothing to limit Congress's authority. And it treats the Constitution no differently than the statute. Now, there's some other things that he adds on to this. He talks about how in Article 3, right, which we're talking about in this very case, con the courts are given the authority to decide cases arising under the Constitution, right? Well, that seems to be saying, look, if the Constitution is at issue, the Supreme Court has jurisdiction. Would the Constitution be giving the court jurisdiction in cases arising under the Constitution, but then saying, but don't look at the Constitution when deciding the case? That doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Moreover, he points to, I think somewhat misleadingly, he points to a very a few handful of situations where it would be actually obvious whether a law is unconstitutional or not. And asks, well, what would we do, right? If someone is elected president, for instance, or someone is convicted of treason, it says there have to be two witnesses, and there's only one, right? Are we supposed to enforce that nonetheless? Now, that's... The, the thing that's misleading about that is 99 out of 100 constitutional cases are not easy, right? They're not, well, the answer is four rather than seven. They are, what is the meaning of due process? So I think some of his examples are misleading, but he, he points out this sort of absurd consequences. If the Constitution's clear, are we supposed to ignore it and not enforce it? That wouldn't make much sense. And we've taken an oath, by the way. The Constitution forces us to take an oath in order to uphold the Constitution. For all these reasons, it is critical, it is important, it is implicit in the document itself that the, the Supreme Court and the judiciary has the power to declare legislative acts of our national legislature unconstitutional. And that becomes pretty important. That is now a deeply embedded structural feature of our constitutional system, such that we can try for 70 years or 100 years to pass health care reform, but ultimately it's in the hands of those nine people as to whether we're going to go forward with it or not, and I guess some you know, IT contractors. Um, okay, one minute left. I, I, I just want to point out one other thing about Marbury. Marbury is generally known as establishing or at least defending this idea of judicial review of legislative acts, acts of Congress. But, but if you dig into that and the part that he's talking about ordering Madison to do something, the Secretary of State, you'll see he's also implicitly saying there's a power to order to say that executive branch officials' actions are unconstitutional as well. Now, where we'll pick up on Wednesday is we'll talk about the extension of this idea of judicial review to the states, which is actually two different questions. Whether the Supreme Court has the authority to declare state laws unconstitutional and whether the Supreme Court has the authority to review the judgments of lower state courts, state Supreme Court.